Thank you so much for joining us today for this Crowdsourcing 101 webinar. I'm very excited on behalf of OCLC to help and host this event, which is brought to you by the Crowd Consortium for Libraries and Museums, a newly formed consortium funded by IMLS to forge national and international partnerships to advance the use of crowdsourcing technologies, tools, user experiences, and platforms to help libraries, museums, and archives. The consortium held their first regional meeting in Boston this fall, and with uh, plans for additional meetings and webinars in the coming year, they're very excited to engage with crowdsourcing experts and those in the field interested in developing crowdsourcing initiatives. Um, to stay informed of the uh, efforts at the Crowd, Cor Crowd Consortium uh, will be sure and share uh, links to their site and ways for you to stay engaged. Thank you to IMLS and also to Tilt Factor and Dartmouth for helping to bring this effort together. I'm excited to introduce our panelists for today's session. We'll begin the day with Mia Ridge, who chairs the museum's computer group at Open University and is a member of the Executive Council of the Association for Commun Computers and the Humanities. Also, Ben Verschbau is here. He is the director of the New York Public Library Digital Library and Labs Project. And also, we're excited to have Victoria Van Heining here, who is the Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow at Zooniverse. Welcome, all of you, and let's begin with Mia. Thank you, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. So I have about 20 minutes to give you an overview of the main, um, the fundamentals of crowdsourcing and show you through some key case studies. And of course, we'll be going into more detail later in the next, with the next two presenters. Um, so I'll define crowdsourcing because it's one of those terms that has been used very widely um, and often applied quite loosely. Um, and I'll focus on crowdsourcing and cultural heritage. I'll show you some example projects and through those we'll see some typical tasks, um, the kinds of input and output content that projects work with. We'll look briefly at participants, their motivations and different levels of engagement. And to me that ties in very closely to the missions of museums, libraries and archives. Um, because our mission is obviously often to engage people in um, various heritage disciplines and not just entertain them um, and then very quickly address some design tips. So crowdsourcing was coined in 2006 um, and very much in the context of outsourcing, so um, in a kind of commercial context. Um, the key definition points in the definition are that it's um, an open call um, so you don't know who's going to receive the call and how they'll receive it to a large group of people and often an unknown group of people. Um, and this is in contrast to outsourcing where the um, task was, tasks that were previously done internally were given to external groups, um, but as part of existing relationships. But another nice way of thinking about it is this concept of cognitive surplus, which is the idea that it's um, the time that we could be spending watching television in the evening um, is also time that could be used to write Wikipedia articles or to um, work with a local history group or to do whatever kind of hobbies that people have. So cultural heritage crowdsourcing can't rely on the financial motivations that um, drive some commercial crowdsourcing. Um, so the task itself has to be meaningful and rewarding so people have to be intrinsically or altruistically motivated to take part. Um, and unlike user-generated content, it's contributing to a shared goal. So we see a lot of user-generated content projects in museums, libraries and archives um, where they might be have your say kiosks, you might be commenting on artworks, and you might be rating books. Um, but often in these projects, the um, contribution is more process of contributing is more valuable than the actual contribution itself. Um, so the, the value is in the process of actually writing the comment, not in the value of the comment for other people. Um, 
So basically, crowdsourcing and cultural heritage is transforming input content into output content. So images um, into uh, tagged images or enhanced records um, via either a powerful purpose or enjoyable tasks. So you're inviting people in to help you with your work. But one of the earliest examples and one of my favourites is Trove, um, which is a project from the National Library of Australia looking at um, putting their digitised newspapers online. When they began this, they knew that the transcription done by computers wouldn't be very accurate because of the age and difficulties of the, um, the typeface in the newspapers. So rather than not put the material online until it was perfect, they decided to put it on and to open up the process of correcting the transcriptions to the readers. Um, they thought that perhaps a few people would do this, people who are reading the newspapers might do it. Um, at the moment, I think they're averaging about 4.7 million transcriptions or corrections a month. So it's really immensely powerful. And there's a number of reasons to this. Um, it's, some people just like transcribing text. It's quite a satisfying sort of micro task to do. Um, there's a powerful sense of altruism. Uh, we'll look at some of those motivations late in, uh, shortly. Family Search is another text transcription project. It's a structured transcription project where you are basically typing information from, in this case, um, census records or family history records, births, deaths, marriages, um, into what are effectively database fields. It's a great way to um, pass time because there's small snippets of text. Um, solving handwriting is a sort of enjoyable challenge. It's immensely powerful and that's partly because family history is a really strong driver of participation online. Um, but it's also because they spend a lot of time working on the design and thinking about how they can make it, how they can optimize it for their users. Transcribe Bentham is almost the opposite of that micro task, transcribing snippets of text. Um, it's a very complex task. You have to be able to read Jeremy Bentham's handwriting. Um, they also ask you to mark up text in TEI, um, which is a form of um, XML-based markup language. So you're making quite subjective judgments based on reading quite tricky handwriting. So it's a very complex task, but it has a powerful purpose, um, and they've managed to be quite successful with this. And again, that's a full text transcription, so you're transcribing the whole of the letter, not just selectively transcribing bits of it. Flipping to another kind of material, this is actually from um, uh, Dartmouth's Tilt Factor project. Um, metadata games are based around the idea of enhancing records, um, usually around images that might have come from books, they might be images of objects, they might be images of artworks or other illustrations. Um, and creating tags that help describe them because this makes them searchable, discoverable in search engines. So this is an example of an altruistic, uh, an extrinsic form of motivation where hopefully the games are so fun that you're playing them because they're fun and the fact that you're helping a museum or a library and archive is really a side effect of that enjoyable play. Moving on to something else entirely, micropasts is a project from the British Museum's Portable Antiquity Scheme that is partly a traditional transcription project where you transcribe um, index cards with um, Bronze Age binds, but they've also got a kind of drawing task where you can draw around the shape of the, I think this is an awl, um, and they turn those drawings, they combine them all and they turn them into 3D models. So it's a new kind of crowdsourcing task where there's a lot of tra text transcription projects, but we're increasingly seeing more inventive kinds of tasks. Um, and again, working with different material, this is the British Library's GeoReferencer project, which has been hugely successful in part because the British Museum has an iconic map collection that many people were glad to have a chance to um, have a look at. Um, the task can be quite complex. Some of these maps are very small in scale. Um, the task is to match up different points on the historic map with the modern map. It might actually involve um, researching the historic place names um, because depending on the scale of the map, you might not even be sure at, at first which country it's in. So again, it can be a quite complex task, but one that some people find immensely rewarding. They enjoy the puzzle aspect of it and they enjoy working closely with um, some sometimes quite gorgeous maps. The Reading Experience Database is a much more scholarly project. Um, the idea is that it's collecting instances of people writing about reading. So 
in this example, someone's reading a room of one's own. It's a very complex task. The data input form is quite long. It involves making many decisions um, about the type of experience, the place, time, country. Um, this isn't typing what you see. This is um, interpreting what you see. It's used in part by people who are actually using the database for their own research purposes. So it's quite a scholarly project, but it is also used by the public. And there's now also a listening experience database. Um, and it's a great way of new forms of scholarly inquiry getting help from the public. So we've seen a lot of different tasks from various forms of transcribing, georeferencing. Um, one important concept to think about is the granularity of the task. So how long it takes to complete, how simple or complex it is. Um, uh, tasks that can be done by lots of people quite quickly can often be very productive. So it takes only a second or two to type or correct an OCR word. Um, but it might be quite a complex task to enter in an, an instance of someone reading a Virginia Woolf book. Um, We've seen tagging. These can be subjective or factual. So they could be tying into people's feelings about an artwork, or they could be tying into where they think a painting was made. Um, they might be asking people to use vocabularies, or they could be entirely free text. Um, they could be entered as markup around text, um, which means getting stuck into things like angle brackets and sort of um, wrapping content around text. Or they might just be tags. Um, in the same way that you might tag someone on Facebook or you might tag a photo album in Flickr. Um, you can also ask people to help you with things like the housekeeping aspects. So sometimes one of the key sayings about crowdsourcing is that it's free as in puppy. It's fantastic to have this, but you're also having to do a lot of maintenance and work um, and allow enough time for play with the um, crowd or communicating with people. So you can ask participants to help you with things like moderating forums, with flagging content for review, um, with answering questions. You're not doing it entirely on your own. You can invite people in. We also see projects that ask people to share knowledge. It might be either research-based tasks, um, or it might be um, collecting people's memories about a particular thing, or collecting knowledge that's out there in the community that the organization wouldn't normally have access to. It could be um, creating links or relationships or categorizing. Um, stating preferences and opinions can be a really useful way of surfacing either the interesting content in large collections. Um, we see that a lot in um, crowd curation, where people are voting for items to be put on display in an exhibition. Um, opinions can be a great way of helping people find random content in large collections. Um, and you'll increasingly hear about crowdfunding, although I don't go into that because I think there'll be another seminar. A lot of the issues around motivation, understanding why participants will be involved, come into play in crowdfunding. Um, but it has some tricky issues for cultural heritage organizations. So people participate in crowdsourcing in some ways for the same reasons they volunteer in museums, libraries, and archives. Um, some people do it because they love the content. Some people do it because they love the task. Others do it because they've always wanted to be more involved but haven't been able to physically travel to a venue um, or they can't get to a venue in the times that it's open. So it's a really wide range of people, but usually there's something about your project that interests them. We also find huge variations in the number of contributions per person. So this um, graph comes from the Old Weather Project, which is a structured transcription project. The pink top, the square in the top left-hand corner um, is all the contributions made by one person. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you see tiny, tiny squares. Each of one represents a page transcribed by, or a single page transcribed by one person. So you'll see that some people do a lot of the work um, and a lot of people do some of the work. You need to think about attracting both. Um, because you'll never get those kinds of super contributors, super volunteers, unless you attract people to look at your project. And you need that range of people coming in and trying things um, to keep a project moving and to give other people um, reasons to stay on. 
So there's a range of motivations for participation, and I tend to group them into three. When you think about it, this one task, this is Trove again, so the task of correcting OCR errors from the newspaper on the right um, and typing the correct words into the box on the left has three potential motivations or three groups of motivations. The first might be people who are interested in Australian history, they want to provide an accurate record of local history. Um, the second might be the puzzle of the task. There's something very satisfying about correcting OCR. Um, unlike everything else we do in life, it's sort of neatly self-contained. So to some people, it's just intrinsically enjoyable. Um, and for others, it might be someone's collecting a quote from a primary source. So other extrinsic motivations, as discussed previously, might be to play games. Um, so the thing that you're doing, it doesn't have to do with the fact that you're helping an organisation, that's just a side effect, it's a nice bonus. There's a large um, drive towards micro-volunteering um, or helping people out online. So sites like these um, portals will have ratings for um, projects that you can work on in your pyjamas, so you don't actually have to get dressed to go out and help a museum. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. Intrinsic motivations at some point just come down to the things that we like doing. So um, the pleasure of doing hobbies, um, for almost any kind of hobby, there's an online version that you can do or a place where you can go and discuss it. Um, there's the enjoyment in learning. Um, one theory is that the reason that games are fun is because they're sort of super productive environments for learning and for mastering new skills. Um, the ability to practice new skills. Often in my work, it's people who are interested in history but don't work as professional historians, so they enjoy the chance to revisit that interest. Um, recognition can be an important motivator. People often start um, participating because of their interest in a subject, but they stay for the community. And we see that um, in research and traditional volunteering in museums, libraries and archives as well. Um, and finally, just a, sort of a pure passion for the subject. Um, the internet is vast and you can find a community for almost any subject online. And I think one really useful way to sort of remember this um, comes back to something that Jane McGonagall did in 2009, um, thinking about games in museums. And she summarised the fact that people want satisfying work to do. They like the experience of being good at something that goes back to mastery. They like spending time with people, so it's community. And they like the chance to be part of something bigger, so that again ties back to that altruistic motivation. Um, and organisations are often interested in crowdsourcing because they know that there's a large gap between um, the terms that ordinary people use to talk about collections and how collections are catalogued, if they're catalogued at all. Um, they know that the terms that people type into Google don't match what they have in their um, catalogue, so it's hard for people to find content. Um, many collections are huge, but resources are small. It's very difficult to get money for straight digitisation projects. But there's also an aspect of creating engaging and meaningful experiences for the public. And I think that we'll hear more about um, citizen history and citizen heart science and how these have taken on, um, taken people through acts of like simple micro tasks or type what you see into more engaging experiences for the public. Um, it's also a chance to access external knowledge and expertise. So I think it's important to think about how participants can go beyond these micro tasks or these um, type what you see projects, partly because after a point, once you know how to read 18th century handwriting, it's less of an exciting challenge. So people are looking for ways to keep stretching and learning new skills. And one way of doing this is inviting people into be more, have more of a role in um, designing the project or designing the research that comes out of the project. We've seen a number of projects have um, new research projects have come out of the process. People have taken off in sort of unexpected side alleys based on things they've discovered in the projects. It's not only serendipitous discoveries, but it's also people discovering interests in themselves that they didn't previously um, realise were going to be so important to them. These models come from citizen science uh, or public participation in science research, but it's a really useful way of thinking about who can help design the shape of a project. 
And again, from citizen science, they've um, found these models where the simple tasks like um, classifying can lead to people participating in community discussion. It might be because they've found something interesting, something curious. Um, they're asking for help with reading handwriting um, or classifying an object. Um, and that community discussion is a really important kind of participation. And some people move on to doing their own research projects. So Family Search, um, the site that gets you to transcribe uh, historic census or birth, death, marriage records, sort of have a, a sense of how simple tasks like transcribing can move people on to more complex tasks like doing family history. So what they call indexing the process of transcribing sort of very specific fields from structured records. They know that there's something about this process that not only gets people, gives them some knowledge about the types of records you deal with in family history, um, the kinds of information that is common in genealogy. Um, it's also brilliant handwriting practice. But they know that people are also m likely to get curious at some point and want to do their own family history. So they, they actively say, you don't need to be into doing your family history. You know, just help us by typing these words. Um, because in their experience, people who start typing words will become interested in history one way or another. They've also provided ways for people to move on to roles with greater responsibility. In their process, arbitration is the process of resolving um, those moments when a transcription is so unclear that the um, uh, transcripts given by the public don't match. So they go to an arbitrator who decides um, what the, the word that is unclear probably is um, and which of the transcriptions supplied is correct. I always think it's important to at least think about the ethics in crowdsourcing. I think in cultural heritage we face far fewer issues because um, hopefully we're never being exploitative um, and people will move on if they feel that a project is exploiting their needs. But I think we always have to think about you know, what are the ethical implications of doing things in this way. So very briefly some design tips um, based on my experience before I hand over to the next case studies. Uh, in my previous work, I found that validating procrastination is a really great way to um, give people, to let them off the hook. It gives them a guilt-free reason to indulge for just a few minutes. Um, I was also making metadata games, and one of my key findings is that for my target audience um, of busy women over the age of 30, they really liked sitting down and having a cup of tea and playing games, but they always felt like they should be doing something more worthwhile with their time. So saying that you're helping a museum um, is a brilliant way of them feeling like it's okay to sit down and play this for a few minutes. Academic and museum and library archive projects tend to be a bit verbose. They can be quite wordy. So one of the design exercises I recommend is going and playing 2048, which has very, very minimal instructions and working out, um, seeing how the game itself, the interface itself teaches you what to do. Um, I apologise if you get addicted, though, because that sometimes happens. Um, but you also, you don't really need gimmicks because we have such brilliant content in museums and libraries and archives. Um, this example is from the Letters of 1916 project, where they've grouped the letters into different categories. So if you scroll down the page, you'll inevitably see something that interests you. Um, and it gives you a hook, a reason to go and have a look at the project and maybe start transcribing some letters. I think it's really important to understand barriers to participation. Um, and I think the New York Public Library does that incredibly well. Um, they really minimize those barriers. Um, it's always important to emphasize the importance of your contribution. Um, trust in the inter interestingness of your tasks and material. Um, but basically, you need to understand your audiences, understand the quirks, um, the good things and the bad things about your material, figure out how the content is going to be used once it's created and then tailor your design to suit. Um, we've got some challenges in the future. Uh, participant retention is always an issue because people do get bored if, if projects stay the same. Designing for mobile is an increasing challenge and opportunity. Um, and there's also, um, as machines get better at some tasks, it reduces the potential role of the things that people can do. So I'll finish on that note. 
um, and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mia. I just wanted to um, thank folks for sharing examples. It's really exciting to see. Um, and one thing I thought was interesting that Megan shared that um, in their experiences with the Smithsonian Digital Volunteer Transcription Center, they're seeing uh, all along the continuum between uh, metadata generation and transcription and all throughout the different motivations as well. So that's an interesting reminder uh, that the project could cover a number of different facets. So thank you so much again for chiming in. And let's actually head on over to our first case study uh, with Ben. And I'm going to pass the ball on over to you. And you're all set. OK. Uh, hi there. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, you sound great. Good, good. Uh, and I'm going to try to keep quiet as I click away. Um, so uh, thank you for for this to CCLA for hosting this and creating this event. It's a fantastic discussion, and I just couldn't have asked for a better setup than what Mia just provided. Um, it's it was really perfect frame for what we're about to get into, and um, had the great pleasure of working remotely with Mia on uh, uh, contributing to the fine volume published by Ashgate just recently that she just showed there at the end. So that's an amazing resource, um, and many of the things I'm about to show you were definitely inspired by, uh, and we help were helped to make the case with. Uh, many of the projects that were just just showcased, and the ones, the more recent ones, are the ones that are now kind of continuing to inspire us and prompt us to um, to do to push this further. So, I'm just basically going to try to give you a, a a look at a flow of different projects that sort of a kind of an oscillation between approaches, and and hopefully you can come away with in this short time how one one step led to the next, and then try to put a couple uh, larger framing thoughts around that. So. Um, let's see if I can move here. So yeah, those are the uh, credentials, uh, the Twitter identifiers, uh, but I think we have those elsewhere. So um, this all began our sort of crowdsourcing journey uh, with project, a project around historical maps, uh, very analogous, directly analogous to the uh, British Library example that uh, Mia showed. And so as you'll see, what we're about, I'm going to get into, we've mostly been focusing on lowering barriers to participation, seeing if people will actually do this stuff, and kind of trying to internally here at MYPL uh, create a model where the curator of a collection is sort of the principal investigator, the kind of project co-lead for these kinds of projects. So there's a lot of things still to figure out, but that's sort of been our focus of these projects. Um, so um, this project, the Map Warper, is very analogous to the British Library example that was just shown. It allows you to kind of match uh, old maps with new maps and to kind of identify enough corresponding points that you can accurately geo uh, rectify the old map to the kind of the uh, current uh, digital uh, world map. And uh, this uh, has been going on since 2010. And our map collection is global in scope. But there's kind of a focus, uh, especially on New York City maps. Um, and uh, these, you know, the process is, is, is essentially lining these up through uh, certain control points, uh, uh, cropping the non-map material, and then stitching these things into layers. So you're looking here at an 1854 street atlas produced by an insurance company that depicts Manhattan from the, the, the battery at the southern tip all the way to 42nd Street, where, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and this is sort of a new kind of collection that we now allow, a new derivative collection that we now make accessible. Um, there are then subsequent tasks about d transcribing and extracting a building level detail from these uh, urban maps. And that we're really interested in getting that data to be machine readable because it, it could become a tremendously powerful resource for uh, creating a data set of shared notions of places as they change over time, or a gazetteer. And it's something we actually have a night news challenge entry in the semifinals for to build just that resource. Um, so these, again, these data sets, uh, whether they are map layers or uh, kind of uh, files of historical buildings, can be shared and exported. And so these are new derivative resources that we're putting an emphasis on making accessible as the crowdsourcing projects unfold. Um, so the progress to date is is relatively modest given the size of the the scale of the the overall objective. Um, but about 5,000 map sheets have been warped, and uh, 120,000 buildings transcribed through the tool I just uh, gave you a glimpse of. Um, the challenges are that the the transcription task, that building level extraction task. Uh oh, I I'm told I'm fading in and out. Um, I hope that you can hear me. Uh, don't. I think I have much control over that, but um. yeah, yeah. Just I, I don't know if it matters how close you are to your mic, but yeah, there's yeah. a little, little bit 
going, so thanks. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to lean in. Um, <laughs> Pretend you're speaking so, to 200 people. <laughs> yes. Continue to, to shout at me in all caps if I fade. Um, so the basic challenges here are that the transcription task of the building level extraction is a bottleneck, and I'll get into that more later. That's very cumbersome and hard. It's sort of a steep learning curve. And, and the learning curve for the tool, the platform, is, is, is steep across the board. And most of the traction we've gotten through volunteers is through on-site workshops uh, in our map division or through classroom collaborations. Some of the folks there uh, then do work at home, especially on the warping tasks. And uh, there are some power users that kind of, uh, as we've seen through use logs, uh, kind of very much mirror the, um, the kind of power user distribution that, that Mia showed. Um, so our next project that really kind of foregrounded crowdsourcing um, was uh, our What's on the Menu project, which I think a number of you probably have seen. Um, and this was a transcription-based project. And again, trying to produce a, a, a new kind of derivative data set. And the me mechanic is very simple, uh, much simpler than in the map warper. And it's just a, we're only asking people to transcribe dishes and prices if available. And um, so this is what the basic transcription view looks like. You see what other people are doing. It's a very bare bones approach to uh, kind of the kind of uh, user collision. It's all working on one document. Um, and there's a kind of a basic workflow where things are moved in a queue. Uh, but there isn't any kind of sophisticated uh, kind of automated uh, analysis of user contributions. We're taking one transcription per item, although things remain ed editable through this workflow. And people uh, email us or tweet at us if there's something they need to unlock or move back in the workflow. So real scotch tape kind of system there. And this, we, you know, we put all our emphasis on designing a very simple task and, and, and facilitating engagement with this collection. So this was technically very rudimentary, but has proved very successful. And we've seen very low instances of abuse. So I was just sort of um, outlining that there. And uh, we've added another task in the last year or two um, to geolocate the menus. Many of them have addresses or geographical information that can be identified or can be classified uh, if they're trans transportation menus. So we're eventually going to be able to offer more ways of sort slicing and dicing the collection through that task. Um, and here's the progress so far. Um, pretty good. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of data transcribed, and, and there are, the public is already working their way through the 17,000 uh, or so menus that have been digitized, working that through again, a uh, second pass in the geolocation. Um, and again, we play, so this is sort of a contrast in the citizen sciences where uh, often a data set is produced to then go back to a research team. We're trying to create living resources wherever possible where the data can be explored and perhaps add to the kind of motivation and the kind of allure of building the resource as you sort of see it growing. So there's one dish being visualized across the, the, uh, the collection. And we do open up that data and have tried to model, you know, what a collection, uh, a crowdsourcing project looks like on a collection level and how do you kind of really open it up through the whole into the whole data ecosystem. And um, and what we're finding very much to our delight is that uh, scholars in the digital humanities have started to pick up this data set as a kind of a one of the few examples of a kind of very subject specific kind of uh, derived data set from a library to practice data curation techniques. So we're seeing the kind of the first pass that the public has done being refined, clustered, deduped by a group of uh, by a, a scholarly project. So it's very promising in terms of the larger life cycle that opens up. Um, our challenges are that, you know, these projects, while exciting to the library and very much uh, very well loved, are don't quite jive with our existing kind of digitization prioritization policies. So we started this as a low-hanging fruit project with content that was already digitized. And when the initial uh, uptake was very, very uh, ferocious, we started digitizing more. But that has slowed as we've had to compete with the rather, you know, with the, with the limited capacity that we as any library has in digitizing. So um, I do think we would have actually be further along in the transcription project had more been digitized. So right now we direct users typically to kind of correction and proofing tasks and let them know when there's new content uh, in the rare instances that there is. Um, and also I think part of this, the other challenge is that while well-loved, these projects don't align to people's um, uh, existing job description terribly well. It's different in our map division where it's sort of very aligned with a larger collection strategy there. 
Um, in other cases, these are kind of spare time labor of love projects. And so while people would love to be spending more of their time on it, it often isn't what they are able to spend the majority of their hours doing during the day. So it's highlighted the need for dedicated cure, uh, community uh, management roles. So the success of menus was, you know, really breaking down the task. So I know I'm probably going a little over time. But I'm going to try to accelerate here. Um, so this brings us back to the map. So here's the iteration and the oscillation. Um, we have this task, which is obviously many tasks rolled into one, and more if you consider that you actually, usually through uh, in-person guidance in a workshop, have to be sh find a place on the map to work on and even consult a key to the map to understand what you're transcribing. So this is a very bundled mesh of tasks, and I think it's not surprising that you know, the uptake has been relatively modest. So we tried to look at, you know, can we break this down into smaller pieces? Uh, taking some of the lessons from the menu project uh, and make it fun, kind of, kind of try to combine the altruistic and intrinsic motivations that Mia articulated with a sort of an extrinsic, you know, motivation of, you know, this is actually kind of enjoyable to do based on, uh, because of the experience or the formalistic qualities of, um, and also, uh, as Mia gestured toward at the end, you know, are we really doing everything we can to do uh, to avoid asking the public to do things that aren't necessary, that computers can do. So we did some experimentation with computer vision techniques to see if we could train computers to read these maps to, at this building level. And what we, we developed a workflow that actually gets pretty good results. Uh, so I'm just showing you one map sheets extraction run through our map vectorizer tool. And the GitHub repo is there at the top. It's open source. Uh, so it's basically an OCR for maps. Um, but like OCR, you know, there, it's not perfect, and there, this begets new tasks and new quality control needs that maybe can be designed into a crowdsourcing project. So that's what we did with our, our building inspector project. And really proud of this project and sort of taking us forward and sort of uh, on a longer timeline of crowdsourcing where we don't just put up one project out, but kind of learn from it, iterate, and, and try out new approaches that involve both smarter task design, but also weaving in computational techniques. So we're really kind of uh, benefiting from advances in technology and putting those computers to work. So here we've basically broken down to date the, uh, the work into four tasks. And this begins with the output of the vectorizer process that I showed you before, which is a computational process that can run through a layer of maps for a given year, you know, sort of overnight. That spits out tens of thousands of polygons. And so task one is just to check the polygons, just check the computer's work. Did it get it right? Is this a building? Is it clearly not a building? Or is it identifying buildings but in, in need of fixing? So in this case, this is three buildings, so you would mark fix. Um, the next, uh, and as you can see, there's some sort of game-informed dynamics. I wouldn't call this a game outright, but in terms of a small tally, there's a basic authentication um, uh, method through uh, third-party services, Twitter, Facebook, and, and Google. Uh, but really beyond that, no community ar ar architecture. But you can at least see a tally that will be saved, and you can sort of check your progress and return. Uh, the next task is fixing those polygons that have marked fix, and I'll tell you how things get into this queue in a moment. Uh, there's a address transcription tool. So we're starting to see blends of different types of tasks in, in one project, in one workflow. And finally, a color identification task. And we're interested in the colors because these have some of that valuable data about materials types and use types for these buildings. So again, things we want to go into that kind of uh, time travel database that we want to build and that we're fantasizing about. And this is designed, we're trying to really also put things out that kind of surprise people, that they don't, they, uh, kind of at a very high standard of web design. And uh, this, this is a web project, so you have to be connected to the internet to use it, but it, uh, it flows, it reformats very fluidly to a small screen. And these tasks all work quite nicely, even on a kind of a smartphone uh, size screen. So, the, just to, one of the last things I'll go over is just how these, these tasks kind of move through uh, a kind of a flow and how we are checking uh, quality. So this is very much based on techniques in the citizen sciences where the same uh, information is put before many users and, uh, and it looks for an agreement. And things that aren't uh, agreed upon kind of get put back into the queue or maybe get put into a kind of a needs expert eyes queue. So basically, that checking task I showed you first, things go through that, and once they are kind of consensus yeses, and that means three or more people agree, um, they can then go into these next two tasks, uh, the addressing and coloring. If they are consensus fix, 
they then go into the fixing task. And once there's a consensus there, um, it moves into the yes queue. So uh, this is really pushing us, you know, we're really now at the kind of the, the edge of our, our research here, you know, even developing different consensus methods. If you're checking, you know, just didn't did the same number of people say, did a certain number of people say yes, that's one thing. If you're looking at did people fix this along the same boundaries, you're doing some really interesting math and statistical stuff. So we're, we're kind of pushing the envelope with our computational methods behind the scenes here in how we are uh, uh, arriving at consensus. And uh, if it's a consensus no, it sort of goes uh, down the chute, as it were. So uh, where we are, we're nearing a million tasks completed. So clearly there's some traction there. But this is actually with relatively modest use. Um, and one of the things we're working on now is a larger strategic plan at the library where crowdsourcing and these kind of community knowledge projects figure prominently and also kind of a general rethink of our web environment. So these projects we've kind of put out there as satellite efforts and they've really had to build their own audiences. And, you know, we've benefited from time to time from obviously having the library umbrella and the publicity engine and affiliate and, you know, the cross promotion with the library divisions where the collection uh, come from, but by and large, it's not woven into the service design of the library. It's not an experience that is really, that you are alerted to when you come to our web property. So that is, it's actually very hard to find these projects on our website, much to my chagrin. So that is something we're changing. These pilots, we're at a point where the pilots sort of made the basic case, and we're starting to rethink a general digital engagement strategy that includes this stuff very prominently. So it's exciting to be on that threshold, uh, and then where we want to get into as well is developing more uh, uh, rich, involving community architectures so people can uh, be better engaged and be recognized for their efforts and kind of uh, walk along those stepping stones maybe to more advanced tasks and responsibilities to really feel a greater sense of ownership over these projects, as Mia was articulating. So, um, and next steps for building Spectre, we'd love to do an offline mode. We have a big subway audience that we want to tap into uh, and love the idea of uh, cataloging buildings uh, of the past while the buildings of the present whiz by above your head. And finally, and as a handoff to Victoria, we are uh, returning back and taking some of this insight of very granular task flows and trying to apply it back to transcription projects where, like Old Weather from Zooniverse or like a project we are prototyping around theater playbills, you're actually trying to get a pretty complex structured data model out of a document rather than just scooping blobs of words out of it. So how do you start transcribing along according to a schema or kind of to produce a tabular data set? So that's the basic, the, the, the question and the, the impetus behind the Scribe project, which builds upon the tool that uh, Zooniverse uh, built behind Old Weather. And we're collaborating now under an NEH grant to produce a kind of a developer-ready toolkit that can uh, help get these pro kinds of projects going more quickly. So we're really excited about that collaboration. and. Um, uh, I'm going to just hand it off to Victoria now, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks for staying with us. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I want to talk to you guys about Operation War Diary, which is a transcription and tagging project that offers a model of metadata collection and volunteer engagement that I hope will be of interest to those listening in. The project is part of the Zooniverse platform, and so before I describe the project in detail, I'll give you all a whirlwind tour of the Zooniverse. Um, Zooniverse specializes in academic crowdsourcing. Uh, volunteers work on data that powers real research, and this is one of the things that Mia um, mentioned is quite powerful earlier. Uh, we have over 1.2 million users, actually, as of today. Um, and a core team who are split between the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and the Department of Astrophysics where I sit at the University of Oxford. And we have over 400 academic library and other project partners around the world, including Ben and his great team over at the New York Public Library. Um, Zooniverse began with a single project called Galaxy Zoo, which was launched in July of 2007 by Dr. Chris Lintott, who's now a professor of astrophysics at the University of Oxford and Dr. Kevin Schwinski, who is only a graduate student at the time. Um, the goal was to process one million images of galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey into two types, spiral, such as the one that you see here, 
and elliptical, a very basic task, but one that would have taken one person, poor Kevin, at least three years of round-the-clock effort to complete. The several thousand strong crowd of volunteers who participated in the initial phase not only completed the task in a matter of months, each image was classified an average of 38 times as opposed to just one time, and thus rendered excellent quality data for each image. The success of Galaxy Zoo, the sort of granular task and multiple user input, led to the foundation of the Zooniverse in Oxford and over 30 new projects in astrophysics, biology, climate science, and the humanities, including in the fields of music, paparology, and the history of World War I. These are just a few of our transcription projects. Um, well, I say a few. Th these are the ones that uh, you can participate in now and also some upcoming projects listed on the bottom. Uh, no URLs because they're very much in uh, the alpha stage. Um, each Zooniverse project so far tackles text transcription in a slightly different way, ranging from character-by-character -character transcription using a keyboard to full text transcription. Ancient Lies, shown here, was the first Zooniverse Humanities project. It launched in uh, 2011 and has attracted more than 250,000 unique visitors who've contributed over one million uh, transcriptions of fragments of ancient Greek papyri from the Oxyrhynchus collection. Ancient Lives invites volunteers to do character-by-character -character transcription. The keyboards that you see here are preloaded with sample characters to make the transcription tasks easier. This is significant because it enables non-specialist participation. Again, that's picking up on a theme that um, Mia commented on earlier. If you go and read the talk and discussion pages, which is sort of a chat um, forum area that's linked to specific fragments or objects in the um, Ancient Lives collection, you'll see certainly in the early stages a lot of users saying that they can't read Greek, but they want to participate, um, and that that was a powerful motivator for them, knowing that they were helping drive real research. Um, while many of us wish that specialists could devote time to crowdsourcing, and I think some crowdsourcing projects have been built with academic specialists and others in mind, um, I think the, the real uh, audience for a lot of projects in the cultural heritage sector are probably people who don't have specialist knowledge, but who with a bit of guidance would really like to get involved. So that brings us to Operation War Diary, which was launched in January of 2014. Um, as you see at the bottom, it was created in partnership with the National Archives in the UK and the Imperial War Museum in London, who generously funded uh, the operation. The goal of the project is to tag and classify the daily diaries of all British Army infantry units on the Western Front. Oh, hello, hello. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, sorry, the, the goal is to uh, classify the daily diaries of all British Army infantry units on the Western Front from 1914 to 1918. The full archive consists of 1.5 million pages chronicling life on the front. Um, interestingly, this crowdsourcing project is directly feeding into another crowdsourcing project at the IWM, which is called Lives of the First World War, which seeks to create a permanent digital memorial to those who lost, lost their lives on the front. The project was awarded a Best of the Web Award for design earlier this year, and our lead project developer uh, on that was Jim O'Donnell, who now works on another humanities-focused project um, with Zooniverse in Oxford. Um, these are some numbers that I'm, I'm quite uh, proud of uh, from Operation War Diary. There are over 1.2 million page views since January, um, almost 11,000 registered users, 55,000 comments on talk, uh, the project um, discussion area, and quite a healthy number of people who are participating. I think that's actually quite a high uh, level of participation, sort of one in 10 or, or so. I can't really do math, but we'll uh, gloss over that. Um, and approximately 61,000 pages have been completed, which means they've been tagged and transcribed by seven users. This is a page shown in the project interface. Um, a first-time visitor to the site completes a brief tutorial, and there's an additional field guide available so that they can refresh their memories. Volunteers use a mixture of tagging and drop-down menus, which you can see on the left-hand side. 
um, they identify what kind of document they're using first, and then there are various drop-downs that are based on the document type. Uh, users mark dates, times, uh, locations, unit activities, and the presence of named individuals, which can be done in free text. Um, the tags enable us to know exactly where on a page um, the mention of a particular event or individual occurs. And as users tag the pages, um, they are building up a pretty rich uh, metadata set, you know, and, and that can be found and, and um, navigated eventually through the National Archives uh, website catalog. Um, if you want to, you can go and use the uh, little white chat box towards the top right under blog and uh, see what other users have said about the page you're working on or contribute your own conversation um, in sort of a Twitter style um, hashtagged uh, 140 character long comment. Seven users oops, then um, tag each page as I already mentioned and their markings and annotations are aggregated by an in-house consensus engine called WD3. The little white strips that you see here contain terminology from the drop-down menus as well as information from the free text fields and the numbers indicate how many users have submitted the same data, and we're sort of having a series of discussions about whether uh, the catalog should include data that's only submitted by one person. Um, so these were the goals um, of OWD, to provide evidence about named individuals, to, f to feed this other crowdsourcing project, to enrich catalogs, and sort of um, as an afterthought in a way, to gather data for academic research. Um, and I think that the main issue, um, the challenge that I want to talk about with this project is that, as Mia said, you know, it's, this, is, this is a puppy and it's not just for Christmas and you have to keep feeding your community. Um, and we did struggle with this in the beginning because many of our partners who um, are very well respected academics or um, leaders in their field in um, libraries and museums didn't um, entirely foresee how much time would be needed to uh, sustain the community and interact with people who had questions on the forum, on the talk forum. Um, so we had a meeting back in May of this year, a few months after launch. We got together various academic uh, participants, um, got a rasta of who's going to write blogs on what topic and who is going to encourage the use of particular hashtags in talk. Um, and I'm really proud and pleased to say that there's been an immense turnaround, a dramatic increase in participation from the academic library and museum side, and a real spike in user participation and the sentiment analysis, I think, if we were to run it, um, would indicate that users are much um, happier and feel more engaged now than they did a few months ago. I'm also glad to say we had some great moderators who emerged who were answering users' questions, other users' questions, um, and they were just normal users, but we uh, gave them the extra status of moderator so that other people could draw um, on their experience and wisdom. And there's some very, very knowledgeable volunteers, and I think that these people emerge in, in all projects. One of the last things I'd add is that um, uh, our, our contact at um, the Imperial War Museum, Rob Livermore has done a really great job of getting this project on Facebook and on Twitter, and that makes all of the difference. And I hope that um, those of you listening today will get a chance to check this project out um, and uh, enjoy. Thanks very much for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much both to Victoria and to Ben as well and to Mia. Um, there have been some great questions that have come through chat, um, and some of you are answering each other, so um, that's excellent. As I said, many of you are coming with experiences and expertise. Uh, there were some questions that I'd like to pose to you all. Um, there was a question early on about whether or not you add the user-generated metadata to the authoritative metadata records. Um, and if so, how do you separate that user versus authoritative uh, metadata in, in the record itself? Why don't we start, um, actually Ben, that, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure, the, 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 the library guy. Um, we, yeah, so not, the answer is not yet. We don't, we have not yet uh, devised a workflow and policy 
to it, it reintegrate uh, these um, the data produced in these projects into kind of core records. Um, I think we're moving we're definitely moving in that direction, and I think you know I anticipated would there would be sort of ways uh, to kind of communicate to the user you know this, the kind of provenance of different data, and just as long as I think we communicate that very clearly, I think that's going to do be a great service to the user. The way that we are integrating it into library services to date is mostly around the uh, kind of making these data sets as resources to themselves open uh, and sort of modeling and exploring how to do that and how to do that well. So through data exports, APIs, uh, and encouraging uses of that data and responding to people asking about how to use it. Um, what we're going to be unveiling in the next couple of months with some updates to our core digital collections website, which is something we also work on, uh, are some uh, links uh, based on like item identifiers so that we can alert the user when looking at, say, one of those insurance sheet maps, hey, this actually also is part of this project where we're, you know, we're transcribing, we're, we're rectifying the maps and then transcribing data out of them and we'll link you to those projects, likewise with the menus and likewise with other projects. So we're trying to now start to connect those dots based on kind of the collections themselves, you know, to kind of uh, open up that life cycle of remediation and development of content. Um, but in terms of formally ingesting it to the records, we're not quite there yet, but moving in that direction. Excellent. All right. And uh, here's another good question that just came through. How do you determine how many people are needed to have consensus on a task? Should it vary by type or task or type of content? Victoria, can you speak to that? Hi, that's a great question, and it really depends so much on, on the type of task. Um, so for a simple classification task like the Galaxies um, uh, case, you might ask people to uh, do it a lot because it's not only going to give you great data, quite clear data, but also machine learning sets. So if you have a sort of machine learning aspect to your work, then you would be interested in that. Um, but for transcription, I think there's sort of a sweet spot between um, how you know the, the point at which you're really n not duplicating but just overdoing effort and potentially draining energy um, and not getting through your tasks quickly enough. I, I don't know that there is a magic number. My instinct for transcription is, is that it's somewhere between three, which is what was done for old weather, and uh, seven, which I think we will be doing for the project with Tate Britain um, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. Excellent. Um, I'm just going to squeeze one more question in here, and I'm going to pose it to Mia. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen uh, folks deal with hosting projects? Um, are they are they hosting them on their own servers, or are they relying on other servers? Can you talk a little bit about that technical aspect of it before we wrap up here? Sure. Well, it's quite difficult often for organizations. Um, we really need something like crowdsourcing as a service. And the Zooniverse, um, without putting words into their mouth, are always looking to doing that. Um, but finding the platforms that suit the material that you're working on and the uses that you want to make of the content um, is really tricky. Um, so you see these projects that build bespoke systems, which means they're perfectly tailored to their material. Um, and to their audiences and the kinds of things they want to get out of them. Uh, you see people using Flickr. So um, the Horniman Museum in London um, and various others just put up photos and ask people to transcribe um, the text that is in those images. If you use specialized systems, they'll do the merging of um, transcriptions and records for you. Um, if you use these ad hoc systems, you're kind of making problems for yourself later on, but it's an easier way to pilot something and to prove interest. Um, and then you get systems like um, Scripto from George Mason, um, which other people have expanded to meet their needs and then shared the code back. So the um, DIY history um, at the University of the Library of Iowa um, has then, they built on Scripto and then the Letters of 1916 project built on that. So we're getting to the point where there's a critical mass of platforms for different needs, but it's still one of the more difficult questions that um, you have to solve when you're setting up a crowdsourcing project. And then 
the follow on questions in terms of how will you support a community on that platform? Does it have built in community? Um, the work that the Smithsonian is doing with using platforms like Twitter to um, post conversations. Um, there are, I'm just looking at the questions, there are various open source platforms. There's a giant Google Doc of um, transcription software, um, which if you ask at Ben W. Brum on Twitter, he can point you to that or I can try and dig it out. Um, but it, the software is, you know, the community is a thing that takes resources going forward, but setting up the software is a thing that is tricky to get right at the start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yet I, I know that the whole issue of community engagement can sometimes be as challenging, but yes, I think um, you're, you're, you're definitely hitting the nail on the head. Um, Victoria, or, yeah, Victoria, can you just chime in on your experience in terms of launching your, your platforms and how you did that? Um, so we've, we've basically done uh, bespoke builds all of the way and really listened to what our um, science team or library team um, was was wanting to extract uh, what was their driving research question. We usually start there. Um, but we are going down the path where we hope to be making generalizable platforms. That's not a great word, but things that um, in the way that WordPress enables you to uh, make a blog post, you know, make a blog, um, set up a website and go easily. Um, hopefully in the next uh, 18 to, to 24 months, we'll be uh, releasing similar things for humanities, um, a lot of transcription, but also marking um, and tagging and metadata collection um, interfaces where you can, if you're a smaller institution and you don't have a big budget, essentially upload your data, beta test it amongst your friends and colleagues, and then uh, release it into the wild, um, at whatever the wild may be. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I want to thank folks for all the other questions that have come through. I'm excited to tell you that there are many ways for you to stay in touch with this project. Definitely uh, be following Crowd Consortium on Twitter. Um, we'll be sure and collect any of these outstanding questions and run them by the panelists, but also um, open them up to this community that will be noodling away at all of this great work. Uh, another easy way to stay up to date is subscribing to the CCLA newsletter, and I've posted that link into chat as well. I just want to thank the staff at CCLA for working with us on pulling this together and to our panelists who brought all this excellent experience and information to, uh, to, to the project and for our community to begin to explore further. It's an exciting time to see uh, such success in those projects that are really driving uh, the innovation in this area and we look forward to learning more in the coming year. So thank you to all of you and thanks for attending and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody.